It's the yeah, nature of the show. Uh, we're about to get started. Um, supposed to be provocative. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, uh, my name is Eric Brown. I work here at the Institute, and it's my pleasure to convene this panel uh, and this discussion with uh, three truly outstanding writers, scholars, and diplomats. I myself have learned quite a bit from all three of them, and I trust that all of you will as well. We are here today, of course, to discuss Joseph Browdy's deeply insightful and important new book, Broadcasting Change, Arabic Media as a Catalyst for Liberalism. Joseph is himself an Arabic media broadcaster, an entrepreneur, a scholar, a writer, and an American patriot who believes, like all of us on this panel, I think, that America needs to revive our finest traditions of expeditionary diplomacy in the Middle East and in other parts of the world. He has a genuine love for the Arabic-speaking world, one that's not selfish or based upon fantasy, but born out of a lifetime of deep personal involvements in the region with their peoples, with their cultures, with their problems and their hopes. He has a genuine, uh, and he's also very good, I should say, at all of this. He's fluent in five languages. He now serves as a trusted member of one of the most important think tanks in the Arabic-speaking Gulf, Al Masbar. He co-edits a leading pan-Arab magazine, Al Majalla. He helps American nonprofits uh, and others uh, to help develop their own strategies for the region in ways that are in tune with how the region itself is thinking about itself and its future. Having traveled with Joseph, I can tell you that he's really a pleasure to work with and uh, somebody that I'm really delighted to have here today at Hudson Institute. Um, we have. In addition to Joseph, two very distinguished uh, speakers who, as I mentioned, bring uh, long careers in government as well as thinking about the Middle East. Ambassador Alberto Fernandez um, had a distinguished career in the State Department and the USIA, including uh, as coordinator for strategic counterterrorism communications at state. He's presently the president of the Middle East Broadcasting Networks, which includes Al Khura. Anyone who has ever turned on an Arabic media um, news program during the 2000s especially is probably very familiar with uh, Ambassador Fernandez, who was uh, on TV quite often during that decade. And after that, we'll have Adam Garfinkel, who is the founding editor of The American Interest, which in my view is one of the best and most liveliest uh, public policy magazines here in Washington. He was previously an editor of the National Interest, and he spent quite a bit of time in the US government, including as a speechwriter for Secretaries of State Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice. So we're really delighted to have all of our speakers here today. Thank you all for coming. Joseph, over to you. Thank you, Eric. Thank you for your very kind introduction and for your hospitality. And thank you, Mr. Brown, for joining Adam and Ambassador Fernandez this afternoon. Um, I bring you some good news and some bad news. The good news is that there is a sensibility that is growing in the region, particularly among youth, <clears throat> that calls for overcoming the legacies of sectarian and ethnic and ideological uh, supremacism that have caused so much damage in the name of uh, holding together a given country and attempting to develop it. Uh, the bad news is that this growing cadre of young people are outnumbered by a countervailing force that was brainwashed in the very same ideologies and in a different way has the wind at its backs because in this uh, period of sectarian warfare stoked by Iran uh, and jihadist trans-state actors, uh, the acrimony and the pain of all that bloodshed um, in some ways um, strengthens their ability to make their case. Now, this situation was comically and sweetly captured uh, in a very brief clip from an Iraqi comedy show uh, called The Bashir Show. And so I, I thought it would be fun uh, to share that clip with you, if you would kindly. Um, <laughs> وحدة الأديان نحن أبناء هذا البلد لنتنصل عن هذه المسميات أبناء هذا البلد أنا عراقي وأنت عراقي ألف رحمة على والديك إيش قد شريف وخير وآدمي 
فعلا هذا ما نحتاجه التنصر عن هالمسميات اذا صار الشيعة والسنة الامور واضحة يعني خلي يفهم الجميع انه من, من الغالب اذا صار الشيعة والسنة انتم الشكلون 15% واحنا نشكل 85% 15% 85% هذه خارطة العراق بمحافظاته طيب لو أردنا أن نقول أن هناك سنة والشيعة فعند ذلك ستكون الخارطة بهذا الشكل بهذا الشكل أن هناك, أن هناك سنة بهذا الامتداد يكون ما راح أقول لك أبرم هاي الورقة وتعرف وين تحطها أو راح أقول لك أبرم هاي الورقة وحطها بجيب ها آخر شيء احنا هم جبنا خريطة خاصة بينا ووزعنا بيها النسب حسب المناطق اللي ساكنين بها العراقيين طلعت ويانا هاي ما طلع ويانا هاي Now, uh, when we ask uh, many specialists in Iraq to explain what's going wrong uh, a lot of the answers are military in nature uh, they have to do with Uh, Iran backing proxy militias, the power of uh, jihadist actors on Iraqi territory, uh, and so on. But if you ask a lot of Iraqis, in their uh, estimation, the core problem lies with the mentality of that young man who was talking about the 85% and the 15%. Um, a person who would appear to have been denied in the, through the Iraqi school system that uh, tool of critical thinking that would enable him to recognize how he is uh, ridiculing himself by contradicting himself. Um, the problem is that people like that are uh, teaching your children at school. Uh, they are preaching at you every Friday. They're in a government office deciding whether to grant your business a license. They're staffing the police. Uh, and alas, they have a, some of them have a seat at the table of very high-level decision-making in the country. And to give you a sense of what that young man might be watching besides the Bashir show, for every one Bashir show, there are any number of sectarian satellite channels that broadcast uh, militant messages and are trying to tweak the culture In, to their advantage. And so the sh second uh, little bit I'd like to share is the cleric Muhammad As-Safi on the very powerful Iran-backed station Al-Ahad, which uh, speaks for one of the largest militias uh, among the so-called popular mobilization forces. And here his assault is not on the rival sect, But would you believe it, Valentine's Day? Uh, and let's see what he has to say about Valentine's Day and what the impact. But the day of 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 the day الشرعية من جهة وللحدود الاجتماعية من جهة هذا طبعا مشكلة المجتمع لازم يتحرك بس نبدأ من اليوم إن شاء الله تعالى إن شاء الله نفلش هذا عيد الحب إن شاء الله تعالى إن شاء الله ما يستمر عيد الحب هذا ما دام هذا المنبر موجود والناس الشرفاء موجودة والناس الأحرار موجودة والناس بوعي ودين وثقافة وتنتبه إن شاء الله هذا عيد الحب ما يستمر إن شاء الله صيحوا بأعلى أصواتكم لبيك يا حسين There is some iPhone footage that I located of the attack on Valentine's Day celebrations in Najaf that followed uh, that sermon a few hours later Um, fortunately, uh, no one died in that attack, attack. A few people were roughed up, and several hundred balloons uh, were popped. But the deeper damage uh, is clearly the assault on a celebration of love uh, and the imposition of a new taboo within the culture, uh, one of many such initiatives uh, that we find uh, over Iraqi airwaves. 
Uh, and so the dilemma facing anyone who stands for liberal egalitarian principles, the likes of the charming talk show host who began uh, the first clip, uh, is how do you challenge uh, the uh, hold that these voices have over the culture? Uh, how do you promote an alternative view of the world? Um, there is no short-term answer to the problem of um, the young man sp who, who speaks about the 85%. There is, however, a long-term answer. It's not particularly expensive, but it does require something that is in short supply in the 21st century, which is patience, uh, sustained uh, effort, and enormous political will. Now, about 50 years ago, a remarkable man um, expressed the desire to do this in a mission statement. Uh, the man was Tunisian President Al-Habib Bourguiba, the liberator of the country from France, uh, and a dictator, uh, perhaps the archetype of an illiberal liberal who believed in instilling liberal values on a conservative population. He spoke uh, to a gathering um, on the exciting occasion of the latest in a long string of pan-Arabist uh, military coups, uh, Nasserist coups. This one, um, the newly minted strongman uh, Muammar al-Qadhafi in Libya. You'll notice a young Qadhafi sitting next to Bourguiba as he delivers these words. Uh, and you'll also see that Gaddafi and others in the audience are laughing at him as he speaks. He is the same as Gaddafi, as you can see. He is not the same as the government, as you can see, 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 as you can
and you're looking at the bitter legacy of the Arab Spring, and you're trying to draw up your plans. Um, in Arabic, they say that you have khiaran ahlaha mur, meaning that you have two options, the sweeter of which is bitter. Um, the less good option in their judgment at the present time is the revolutionary option because it seems to have led to chaos and because even when there are elections, those elections may well lead to the enshrining of an extremist ideology, um, the calcification of communal, communal divisions, or the coronation of a strong man. So the other option is to work within a systemic framework if there is an environment where a leader begins to speak the language of Bourguiba, begins to signal that he wants to open a space uh, for the inculcation of liberal principles, if only social and not political values, to look for those frameworks and to uh, nestle within them and to push against the walls that are imposed uh, by the establishment. So I wrote this book because in traveling in the region and being quite active uh, in Arabic media, uh, I found that these, uh, this new direction or this old new direction um, is manifesting in several important Arab countries, if to varying degrees. Um, one place that is truly worth looking at uh, is Egypt today. Um, in light of the Bourguiba comment you just saw, it is interesting to watch uh, President Sisi of Egypt uh, talking about the role of media in accomplishing um, the cultural goals that uh, he wants to pursue. أنا شايف إن دور الإعلام دور هيبقى حاكم جدا لإعادة اصطفاف المصريين. في عندنا إشكالية في الخطاب الديني. إشكالية كبيرة جدا جدا جدا. دي عاملة تسببت تسببت في إن إحنا مش قادرين نتحرك لقدام بشكل مريح ومناسب. الوعي كمان محتاج شو وعي المصريين بيتشكل في تقديري في الأسرة في دور العبادة وفي المدرسة وبالإعلام والإعلام قد يكون هو الأهم دلوقتي أكتر من أي حاجة تانية لازم نعترف أن ما فيش استراتيجية عالمية ولا سياسة عالمية يمكن كتير من حضراتكم ما يتصورش أن النقطة دي نقطة مهمة في حوارنا اللي احنا بنتكلم فيه لكن أنا بصراحة شايفها أنها مشكلة حقيقية لازم نشتغل عليها لازم مش الإعلام بس ده مؤسسات الدولة كلها بالكامل لازم تتحرك now, liberals across the region were, of course, in Egypt and far beyond, were looking very intently after this statement about three years ago to see uh, how, if at all, Sisi would attempt to act on this uh, statement of purpose. Um, he is the only example of an autocrat in a post uh, Arab Spring revolu revolutionary state who has been able to at least attempt to revive the heavy machinery uh, of uh, media and information control that existed on the eve of the revolutions. Um, in speaking and focusing about media, I think he manifests an awareness of the vast difference between life at the time of Bourguiba and this interconnected world now, where Arab states have lost control of the flow of information in and out of their borders, uh, and the possibility of galvanizing a coherent national project is severely challenged. He knows, as so many other, as so many liberals do, that um, in a country or in a society where school departments are calcified, religious leadership are exceptionally rigid. Uh, media is the most fluid and dynamic environment to rapidly, potentially, reach a large number of people. Uh, media, in many ways, has been a disappointment in Egypt. We have seen 
uh, conspiracy theories used to explain domestic corruption, uh, allegations that uh, the Muslim Brotherhood is a Jewish or a Zionist creation, even as the Muslim Brotherhood alleges that Sisi's mother is a Moroccan Jew in its cultural context meant to be an insult. Um, and yet, there have also been some remarkable developments in Egyptian media. Uh, a recent uh, Ramadan TV season saw the debut of a program called Harat al Yahud, the Jewish Quarter, a flawed but earnest attempt to recreate multi confessional Cairo on the eve of the 1948 Arab Israeli War. Uh, as Ambassador Fernandez knows very well, Egypt has seen um, uh, voices calling for radical reform of religious teachings in the country enjoy a massive platform to convey to tens of millions of people ideas that their antecedents uh, could only write about for a small elite audience. So these are significant developments. Uh, another place where change is clearly afoot, in particular in the media, is Saudi Arabia. Uh, a country whose most recent uh, reforms have captured uh, international attention, uh, but also a place in which liberals have been really clawing their way into the mainstream, uh, particularly within some media companies, uh, for about, a, well, for three quarters of a generation. Um, I had the opportunity to work with some Saudi media figures, uh, convening them in a gathering, uh, and engaging them in sort of creative plans about how to uh, promote their ideas in uh, their public discussion. This was now uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, and as we begin to wind down, I'd like to give you a sense of possibility by showing you the work of some of the figures um, whom we got to know uh, in that context. One of them was the head writer of a hit Saudi comedy, uh, collection of skits, sort of Saturday Night Live-like, that debuted on Saudi public television, government-owned television, and had a 17-year run. It was called Tash Matash, which roughly translates as you either get it or you, do or you don't. Uh, and I think that um, you're all going to get the humor in this little skit. <laughs> السلام <تصفيق> ما نقدر ندخل البيت من غير رجال قسم بالله قسم بالله ودي أخدمكم في عيوني هذه لكن ما نقدر ما نقدر ندخل بدون محرم مصادق والله ما قال الله الصدق هيا في أمان الله خلفتنا العافية ستر عليكم ستر عليكم ستر عليكم Earlier you saw in the Valentine's Day sermon uh, the imposition of a taboo. Uh, here you see the smashing of a taboo. This uh, aired quite some time ago, and at the time it was a sensation uh, and a cause for the issuing of death threats to the people who were behind this uh, little skit. Um, people who, and this is a, uh, a group of entertainers who early on um, for every four, every ten skits they submitted, uh, four would be rejected by censors. Uh, and there's an interesting book about their effort. It's called The Battles of Tash Matash that chronicles uh, the very hard work and, and, and fighting and pushing within the Ministry of Information uh, that these people did in order to gradually challenge clerical hegemony over the, uh, the popular culture. Um, and testimony to their success is the fact that older scripts, once rejected, were eventually accepted, or at that 
rejected because they weren't uh, challenging enough or controversial enough. And people said, you need to push a little harder. Um, and women today, in looking at the lifting of the ban on uh, driving rights, uh, at the uh, stripping of the religious police of their authority to make arrests, uh, and other encouraging reforms, do credit uh, this program and others like it uh, with having nudged the discussion forward, agitated for change, and built and enhanced public support uh, for the reforms that the political leadership eventually made. Um, another way in which Saudi liberals have used media is to use news media uh, to treat the news as a series of teachable moments, if you will, uh, to enable them to make their points. Uh, a kind of liberal exhortation via news commentary. One of the most passionate commentators who has done this continu continuously for quite some time is uh, Mansour Ngedan, uh, formerly himself a firebrand and now a committed liberal. Uh, in this clip from two th 2014, he's asked to comment on uh, a decision that was just made by the late King Abdullah to crack down on indoctrination for the Muslim Brotherhood in Saudi public schools. Uh, and what I would ask you to look for in this clip is how Mansoor is pushing beyond the official decision, the limited decision of going after the Brotherhood, to talk about other Islamist strands, tougher targets, uh, as well as augmenting the um, assault on extremists with a positive vision of what ought to come in place of their teachings. من الرياض الكاتب الصحفي منصور لنجدان يعني أهمية تطبيق مثل هذا القرار اليوم في هذه الفترة في المدارس سيد منصور هي تأخرت قرابة ثلاثة عقود هذه الخطوة لكن بالتأكيد هي خطوة مهمة جدا في طريق طويل سيكون مليئا بالعقبات مليئا بالمعاناة مليئا بالآلام مليئا بالكثير من التضحيات وأتمنى وكما أتمنى أيضا أن يتساوق هذا القرار أيضا بتوعية أكثر بالانفتاح نحو الآخر أن يصل الوعي إلى كل شاب وإلى كل طالب وإلى كل شاب سعودي إلى أن أخاك في الوطن الذي يقبع في المنطقة الشرقية في القطيف أو الأحساء من الشيعة أو في المدينة هو أخوه في الوطن وعليه أن يكون أقرب إليه من إخوان المسلمين الذين في الحقيقة هم الخطر الحقيقي على الوطن وعلى سلمة هل تتوقع بالفعل أنه في تغلغل في داخل المدارس لنشر مثل هذه الأفكار؟ هو تغلغل الأخوان المسلمين وتغلغل الإسلام السياسي وتغلغل الفكر القاعدي والجهادي هو عميق جدا مع الأسف الشديد وقد ضرب بجذوره منذ عقود طويلة ولكن الحمد لله أن الآن صحونا واستيقظنا يبقى أيضا أن جميع المؤسسات الحكومية في التربية والتعليم أيضا وفي التعليم العالي أيضا وفي وزارة الشؤون الإسلامية والأوقاف والدعوة والإرشاد لابد أن تطلع بمسؤولية وتتحمل مسؤوليتها these actors, uh, uh, unbeknownst to many for a very long time, uh, but now plain as day, uh, have managed to achieve leadership positions in several uh, Saudi media companies. Uh, people like them are also present and prominent in uh, uh, satellite networks in numerous other Arab countries. Uh, and I think one of the questions that might face Americans as we take stock uh, of this remarkable shift in the public discussion is what might be, what if anything can be done to uh, sharpen their capacities and to expand the space in which they are now permitted to act. Um, the first thing I'd like to say in responding to that question is that um, these figures want Americans to get involved. This is not a matter of meddling or an unwanted intervention. 
uh, they are themselves approaching outsiders who they feel can be helpful in various ways and asking for assistance. Now, the kinds of assistance that could be provided include um, both a crackdown on the extremist channels that they are competing with and uh, the strengthening of the content that they themselves are developing. In terms of the crackdown, um, the likes of Al Ahd, the channel in which uh, the cleric uh, railed against Valentine's Day, uh, include dozens of channels that are controlled by the Iranian government, some of them operating within, in, with impunity on the territory of um, on Arab territories controlled by Shiite militias, others based in Iran, and some based in Western capitals, including uh, London and Paris. Um, the idea that um, it would be helpful to work with Arab partners to block these broadcasts is something that is discussed uh, often uh, in establishment liberal circles in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere. Not just Shiite broadcasts backed by Iran, but also indeed the Sunni broadcasts, which are the mirror image of these. Um, and so one way it might be possible for Americans to help is to apply the same logic of the crackdowns on extremist social media to the broadcast media, which is actually more pervasive than Twitter and Facebook. It's more pervasive because not only are people who can't read and don't have access to uh, a computer watching it, but also when you're tweeting, in order to make your point, you're often tweeting clips from the TV broadcasts. Now, on the positive side, these same actors are looking for um, the benefits of media education, uh, not the traditional kind of media education that we have found some uh, NGOs offering, which is primarily about um, the notion of a confrontation between uh, free journalists and uh, an autocracy. Uh, they are interested instead in the question of how do you promote values, social values, uh, using um, establishment platforms, navigating red lines, um, and uh, working within the confines also of social norms that are their own kind of censorship. Uh, they're interested in learning from other, from journalists and uh, entertainers in other ideologically contested environments, whether in South America or the island of Sicily, which once fought a cultural campaign against the mafia in the 1990s, or some of the East Asian democracies. They're also interested in co-productions uh, with American enterprises. Uh, and indeed, some of them need help from people like Ambassador Fernandez, uh, who have no such restrictions uh, in uh, putting their own content um, on the likes of al Hurra. Uh, it's interesting to note, for example, that the Iraqi comic we saw at the beginning uh, is now hosting a show on the Deutsche Welle uh, TV network. Um, so there are a great many opportunities uh, to engage these elements. I'll say one more which is that since Arab governments dominate the most powerful media companies in nearly every Arab country, uh, the, those governments with which the United States is in a transactional alliance um, should be in a conversation with Americans about media, not just about um, military and security matters, not just about sleuthing and intelligence, but also about their efforts to engineer cultural change for better and for worse. Um, this is an area uh, I find um, that, to my knowledge, the US government has not been particularly articulate uh, about when discussing um, uh, cooperation uh, with its Arab allies. And I think we should be more aware 
uh, and more engaged in that realm too. Uh, in order to do any of this, it will be necessary to prepare uh, a cadre of bilingual, bicultural specialists, we could call them expeditionary diplomats, who are prepared to study the informational environment, to find liberal actors worthy of support, to learn what they need, and to help them achieve their goals. Uh, that in itself is a challenge, I think, uh, but one that is worth um, uh, pursuing. Um, so I'll, I'll cut it there and uh, leave it to the ambassador and Adam to uh, uh, share their views as well. <coughs> uh, thank you. Um, um, I, first of all, read the book. It's a very interesting book. I think it's a great read. It has a lot of uh, great information. There's a line that opens the last chapter in the book of conclusions where you mention something about how um, um, we're living in a period which may not, we may not see as a time, a moment of opportunity that we have right now that we might not see again for a generation. Um, and, and I think that's true. Um, I don't want to repeat anything that you said. I, I'll focus on my own little corner, which is, what should the U.S. government do? The U.S. government spends, through the Broadcasting Board of Governors to the organization which I head, the Middle East Broadcasting Networks, about $100 million a year to have uh, Arabic language broadcasting uh, you know, to the Arab world. What should we do? Uh, I've been very informed, coincidentally, by many of the of the observations that that Joseph had. Um, it, it seems to me we're living a historic moment of opportunity in the region, where um, there's a seeming paradox. The the regimes in the region are seemingly very powerful after the experience of the of of the Arab Spring. Uh, and so you have the dominant discourse in the region is the discourse of regimes. Uh, the second most important discourse in the region is the discourse of Islamists. This is a fluid, both those categories are very fluid. There are all kinds of things in there. There are reformers, there are autocrats, there are liberal voices. But generally, this, this is the voice in the region. People are looking today for something different than that. Yes, there are there are uh, elements of, of liberalism that exist. Saudi Arabia especially, I think, is a very positive experience that we're seeing now that could lead to something very important. It could. It hasn't yet. Uh, other places I'm less uh, optimistic about. For example, you mentioned uh, radical stations. One of the most poisonous stations that I'm aware of in the Arab world was a station that was driven out some years ago from Saudi Arabia the Saudi-funded station, Wissal, and supposedly is in Cairo. So not in the West, in uh, the Egypt of our good friend who is fighting the struggle against uh, you know, uh, extremism, and yet there is a station, a very sectarian station, putting out poison there. This is the problem in regimes in the region. They often have this you know, uh, uh, split personality. On the one hand, they talk about reform. On the one hand, they talk about liberalism. But then on the other hand, they take actions which kind of create an environment conducive to people talking about, you know, let's go blow up some uh, Valentine's Day's balloons or whatever that is, or, or actually violent things. So th the way I see it, um, having taken over MBM six months ago, is that the US government has a tool which it spends money on, which I think has uh, at times underperformed during the years and has lacked, I think, a very essential thing. It has lacked a, a, a basic identity. What are we for? What are we interested in pushing out? What are we interested in presenting? Uh, and, and because the, the, the Arab media market is saturated, you could say oversaturated, if you want to succeed, you have to find a unique voice. You have to be a, 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 you know, a, a choice, a voice, not an echo of what others have. If you're putting out the stuff that everyone else is, 
news headlines taken from Reuters and AP and then lots of pablum, nobody's going to watch you. Um, so what I am trying to do with MBN and with Al Hora is to put together a, um, a package of material which is going to be unique, which is going to be premium broadcasting and premium content that you can't find elsewhere. Uh, because what you have is you have the discourse of regimes, you have the discourse of Islamists, and you also have, and Joseph alluded to it, you have the discourse of illiberal players who are aggressively pushing their brand. Iran being one of them, and Iran's proxies, and Russia being another one. And the rise of RT Arabic over the last few years is something that, that should concern us about. So at MBN, we have a very aggressive uh, program of reform and transformation in the next six months, where you're going to see uh, this American broadcaster have fresh, new, aggressive content that is deeply embracing its American identity and also taking a preferential option towards a liberal agenda. Liberal not in the sense of liberal in the United States, but a liberal agenda for the region. And what we are aggressively doing is giving, we've already started doing this, is giving space towards reformers, giving space for liberals, for seculars, for free thinkers. Uh, to give you an example, one of the things that we started, which I'm most proud of, is a, we started an op-ed page online, Menzawiya Ukhra, which we began in August, which basically has 20 to 25 uh, columnists uh, who are outspoken and aggressive and edgy, speaking about the issues of the day. Many of them are people who have limitations about what they can write about in the region. They have no limitations when they write about, uh, when they write for us. They can criticize anyone and anything, including the American administration. But they're also criticizing trends in the region, and they're criticizing and talking about issues of religion, issues of politics, uh, social issues. And what we've seen is there's a deep hunger for this. And we've seen on alhora.com with this material, the, the op-ed premium content that we're putting out, we're seeing numbers that we've never seen before in our regular content. Why? Because if you're having an article, an alhora.com article about you know, whatever is in the news today, you can get that in a dozen other places. But if you're putting out premium content, opinion uh, content, that you can't find elsewhere, or you can't find so bluntly elsewhere. So for example, when we had the Jerusalem controversy and President Trump, we had one of our columnists write about, is Jerusalem really so important in Islam? Uh, this was a Muslim writing this. It was not an Israeli or an American or whatever, you know, asking this question. Um, and so when we have material like this, which uh, challenges kind of the Islamist discourse and the discourse of regimes, we're offering people, I think, something fresh and interesting that, uh, that uh, uh, people are going to be attracted to. The challenge is not so much to have an appeal to a mass audience, I think, given the saturated nature of the media environment, but to a niche audience. And so I think an American media apparatus that both delivers fair and balanced news reporting, but also has a voice that also says we are unabashedly uh, for certain types of uh, activism and uh, uh, worldviews that exist in the region not packaging American stuff and forcing it down the throat of people in the region. That's never going to work. But, but highlighting autochthonous voices that exist in the region on their own, uh, I think is something that is lacking and something that we find very attractive. Not only do we have our columnists doing this on Al Hora television, we've highlighted and began highlighting both living and dead reformers, liberals, and secularists. So you can see people talking about the thoughts of someone like the great Sudanese thinker, Mahmoud Mohamed Taha, who was executed by the Sudanese regime some 30 years ago, or, or, or uh, Sadiq al-Azim, or uh, Farad Foda, or whatever. And also existing people, people like Dr. Mohamed Shahroor, or Syed al-Kimni, or people like that who are living speakers, who are 
pushing aggressively a reform agenda. That's what we're trying to do. Hopefully in the next six months as our reform agenda and our transformation agenda is implemented, you're going to see us to be able to challenge not just the tired discourse of regimes and the poisonous discourse of the Islamists, but also to take on the venom of the disinformation that Russia and Iran and other uh, hostile voices, hostile adversaries of the United States are putting out. I think it's a fascinating time uh, to, be, to be working in Arab broadcast media. As, as Joseph said, I think this is a golden opportunity that we have right now for the United States to really affect change. Yes, it's not about snapping your fingers and all of a sudden people are going to become Jeffersonian Democrats. That's not going to happen. Certainly not going to happen overnight. But it's actually copying what Islamists and in other places communists did, which is the slow, steady, constant work of building audiences, of building constituencies. When we look at Salafi jihadism in the region, when we look at Islamism, the work of the MB, this didn't happen overnight. These were movements where there was an investment made, investment in money, media, publishing, universities, NGOs, etc. What we're living today, the horrors that we see in the Arab world today and the Muslim world today, are the result of people putting their time and effort and money over decades including some of our friends, unfortunately, mm -hmm. doing that over decades, which have led to what we have today. It's incumbent on all us, the US government and others, people in the private sector, to do the same thing, to do that slow, steady work of investment. In Spanish, we call it trabajo de hormiga, the work of an ant, You know, an ant taking a grain of sand and putting another grain of sand and building it over time. That's the way you affect change over the region. All too often, governments, we have kind of a four-year or a one-year or a two-year time span, and this is a problem. We need to work kind of long-term and build the type of region that we want to see. Adam. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> just full disclosure, uh, Eric was very generous in praising my capabilities and my uh, length of government service, but, um, and I appreciate that, even though it's not true. I look around the room and I see, I see several people, mostly in the back row for some odd reason, <laughs> who have vastly more government experience and knowledge of the region than I do. So uh, I asked Eric, uh, you know, what I was doing up here, really. And I guess I'm going to find out now uh, <laughs> as I start to say things and I don't know. Uh, first of all, about the book, I really want to talk about the book. I, I, I think it's a fine, fine book to invest your time in. You should read it. There's nothing like it. it has a, there's a combination of scholarship, genuine scholarship. There are lots of footnotes. Scholarship, uh, serious thinking, uh, personal investment, anecdote, but also, most important, a kind of a careful optimism about what would be possible if we were patient and understood uh, for the long haul, the kinds of things that uh, the United States and other Western governments can do to assist people in the region who have um, kindred spirits uh, in terms of politics and society with us. And they're there. They're there. I mean, Joseph is perfectly right to paint a kind of dark picture of current circumstances. And it's pretty dark. Um, uh, and that said, we don't know what the future will bring. This may be a time of opportunity, or it may not, but we don't know what the future will bring. There might be a moment, which no one can predict, when a liberal opening is more likely to take root than, than it is today. And so against that time, we need to be planning. We need to be creating assets. We need to be investing in the possibility. Because if we don't, we miss the, we miss the opportunity when, when it does arise. So there's nothing about um, the cautious optimism in the book that I could take any issue with. Now, Joseph is much younger than I am. In case you haven't noticed, my, my beard is gray. And as, uh, as Archie the Cockroach said to Mahidabel the Cat, uh, an optimist is a guy without much experience. That's from Don Marquis, for those of you that uh, are not up on your uh, 1930s interwar literature. Um, I'm not as much of an optimist. I, I'm, I'm actually more into the maw of curmudgeonly, curmudgeonly uh, period of my life right now. And I think things are, um, uh, although hopeful, 
in the long run, they're not so hot right now. For example, uh, good news, bad news. Um, this is a moment of opportunity in the sense that it's clear that there are a lot of young people in the region who are fed up with the, um, uh, the bloody harvest of this, this sectarian madness that has overtaken so many countries over, what, more than a dozen years now. And you have to remember, it's been a while. Uh, it was even before the Arab Spring proper. You, you, you saw this poison, this toxin in these societies. Well, you now have an entire generation that's grown up looking at the consequence of this. And a lot of them don't like it. So there really is a potential there for um, change. Uh, people are looking around for something better than what they've got. So that's the good news, and that, that is an opportunity. I mean, a, lot of, a lot of cultural locks have been smashed by, by the, uh, um, the very sad stories in these most, many countries of the past dozen or so years. The bad news is that there aren't any liberals in the Civil War. And almost all of these countries are involved in one, one, to one extent or another in a kind of a cultural, cultural civil war. Uh, centrists and, and nice people get, get washed to the side. Uh, we know, those of us that have studied the region, gone to the region a lot, we know about the, the proverbial cycle of Dawa Muhabarat, Dawa Muhabarat. And in that, in that, in that, uh, in that tension between uh, those who would rebel against an autocratic status quo and then the uh, uh, the, the, the police services who come down harder than ever, in that cycle, uh, anybody who tries to be reasonable and moderate in the middle tends to get marginalized. That's what happens in circumstances like this. Worse than that, worse than that, and this is what I, what I really do worry about, you've got so many young people in the region, um, in some countries more than others, but you've got so many young people who are soul-seared by what has been going on over so many years in so many countries. You have orphans. You have people who are kids, who have been traumatized, right? Uh, in order for a human being to set rooted anchors in social life so that a society can, can, can proceed normally, more or less stably, more or less as a human community, people need three things, basically. They need identity, they need community, and they need purpose. They need to know who they are, they need to be able to find others who are like them, and from that dialectic, you get a sense of what you're doing in life, why you're here, your purpose. If one or two or all three of those anchors of social rootedness are destroyed by the kinds of things that have, that have been going on, you get really raw souls. And raw souls who lack identity or who lack community or who lack purpose are easy prey for entrepreneurial radicals, Islamist radicals. So on the one hand, there are opportunities. On the other hand, there are people roaming around just about every country in the region who are tinder for very, a gr very great deal of nastiness lying ahead. Now, some of that nastiness may spill out of the region, but I, I suspect that, as before, most of it is going to be located within the region. So while I'm actually optimistic um, uh, looking ahead, I'd say we have another 10, 12, 14 years, maybe, until this younger generation can can find its way and, and really get, get, get legs in, in the society, we have another dozen years or so uh, of what's likely to be a very unhappy, very unhappy period. So what we're doing, I mean, you mentioned the ants, right? George Schultz, George Schultz used to talk about the gardening phase of diplomacy, things that you prepare for against the day when investments might be, might be actionable. That's what we're looking to. Now the question is, can the United States government do anything like that? Can the United States government, first of all, reorganize itself so far as that's necessary to do the kinds of things that Joseph would like to do, including just creating this cadre of, what would you say, 80 to 120 people. Can the U.S. government reorganize itself to do that kind of thing? Uh, I had a front row seat uh, after, after 911 looking at R in the State Department, ECA, IIP, and from my experience, looking at, looking at it, my answer would have to be, uh-uh. And nowadays, looking at, at what's happened to the State Department since and the current, the current funding uh, issues that we all know about, uh, my uh-uh turns into an uh-uh. So it seems to me that if, if, if we're going to do this kind of thing, we have to think about the modalities of implementing Joseph's very forward-looking, stretch goal kinds of ideas. What, what can we do to create a basis, a template, an, a bureaucratic template that can sustain this kind of activity uh, for as long as it needs to be sustained to eventually possibly pay off down the road? And it seems to me that uh, we haven't thought through very well, and the book doesn't go into this in particular because 
Uh, and it's no, it's no really no fault of the book. Books only can do what they say they're going to do. It's not fair to criticize a book for what it never says it's trying to do. But, but people who have some policy experience ought to, ought to be thinking about just how you do these things. Is a public-private partnership a better, a better uh, option than trying to stick something like this into an existing State Department organizational box? I don't know. I haven't given it a lot of, a lot of thought. But it seems to me pretty obvious from people who've, who've spent time in government that unless you, unless you reorganize the bureaucracy in such a way as to get something new done, it doesn't get done because bureaucracies do what they do. And they won't do anything else, save for two, uh, two exceptions. One, a full frontal crisis, or very rare, highly enlightened leadership. Right? Uh, absent those things, bureaucracies will continue to do what they do. And so you need to find some way to you know, focus the energy to get done what you want to get done. I just have only a few other comments. You have to read the book. Uh, really, uh, you'll enjoy it. It's actually, there are great stories in it. Uh, I learned a lot just from the stories. But uh, there are a few things I would like to just mention. Joseph actually starts off in a chapter in which he makes the outrageous claim that culture matters in dealing with uh, other countries. Now, of course, this is heretical uh, in the American Enlightenment light universalisms, which tell us, and how many times have we heard a president or uh, a cabinet official tell us that people are the same all over the world, and everybody wants the same thing for their children. It's a great applause line in, a, in an increasingly multicultural country like ours, but as, as guidance for how to conduct one, uh, American diplomacy abroad, it's about as misleading, it's about as misleading a, a statement as one can imagine. Culture does matter. Uh, and Joseph gives examples of how all kinds of you know, toolkit kinds of thing, things we can do to help other, other cultures how to create an independent judiciary, how to, how to nurture a free press. All of this stuff is not going to get you very far unless the attitudes in the society, like what Bourguiba was talking about, unless the attitudes in the society match the institutions that you're trying to build. This is sociology 101, folks, right? Institutions and attitudes have to align. If they don't, it won't work very well. How do you, how do you force march attitudes into a new sort of realm of thinking? It's, nobody knows how to do this. Uh, Joseph raises a couple of examples that are, that are seemingly heartening. He talks about uh, uh, Sicily and dealing with the mafia, right? He talks about South Korea, how uh, Park Chung-hee, uh, an autocratic ruler, nevertheless managed to seed democratic, or not so much democratic, but that too, liberal, liberal ideals, liberal values in the society that eventually, and talks about Singapore. But one thing Joseph doesn't talk about, and this um, I, I just have to mention, he talks about culture, but he never talks about social structure. Never, and, and culture and social structure work as an ongoing di dialectic in political sociology, if you want to understand anything. He never talks about uh, tribalism, never mentions the word tribe. There's no uh, entry in the index for either one. And I think it matters, because it's not just culture, but social structure matters. Uh, South Korea is not tribal. Singapore is not tribal. These also have strong state traditions. <laughs> Ironically, in the Korean case, as a result of the Japanese occupation, but never mind, they have strong state traditions. In order to do some of these things, you need a state that has executive function competency, right? Several of the Arab states just really don't. I mean, the Mojabarat's pretty, pretty good, but on all the other things that they, you know, they're not so, not so hot. Weak Wataniya, weak stateness in a, lot of these, in a lot of these places. So I think some of the comparisons, though hopeful, really don't line up with social structural realities the way that the region really is. Um, another comment I want to make is that uh, Joseph mentions women in the book quite often, but I would mention them even more. Um, in the cases I know about, and again, again my, my knowledge of this is extraordinarily limited, really. In the cases that I know about where you've, you've seen positive and sustained change, usually there are women involved. I, I've said many times that women in the Arab world are the barometer of social change. If you see them organizing, if you see them uh, able to and taking autonomous action as women in society, you're going to see change. And this surprises a lot of Westerners who don't know much about, about this part of the world. The, the common image is that men are everything and men dominate the whole society. And women are these sort of second class citizens whose, whose testimony doesn't even matter very much in a, and so on. This is really a, a, a total distortion of reality in this part of the world. If you've ever seen or imagined or read uh, uh, novels in which uh, the 
basically the men control the public sphere, the public space. They're out there in the world. But the women control the private space, the home, and the moral education of young children. So you have this image of the matron of the house who has the key to the closet where the food is. All right? And she treats her, her daughter-in-law like a scullery maid until she has a male heir, after which she and he can do no wrong. So the power of, of women in society uh, is vastly under, underestimated uh, by people who don't understand how this works. Women are, sisterhood is powerful. So I think uh, getting more women involved in broadcasting, get, getting more women involved in journalism, I think is a key to the kind of changes that you, that you, you want to bring about and that, that, of course, I think we all, we all support. Um, comment about television. I mean, it's obviously true that TV is, satellite TV is really important in the Arab world, partly because of levels of, of functional illiteracy. But it's, I think it's a mistake to, to put all the eggs in the television basket. Television is an inherently um, flawed technology. We no longer have 24,000 volt cathode ray tubes aimed at our heads. We have different kinds of technologies in te television. But television still is highly visual medium. And visual mediums are high, long on emotion and, and short on, on, uh, on, on rational um, parts of the brain that light up when you see these things. Uh, there's a limit to what television can do. Um, it needs to be explored. It needs to be exploited. But there are other things that I think are just as important. For example, if any of you have been to the Arab world, hung around in various countries, what you notice is that the radio is always on. The radio is always on in the cafes. The radio is always on in the construction sites. The radio is just always on. And it's usually music, right? And I think that the lyrics to the music, uh, uh, the, the popular music, especially for young people, is a way to augment what you might want to do with television. So I really think the musicians uh, uh, are a key. Popular musicians are a key to this kind of effort in, in, in slowly transforming values in, in, in the culture. And finally, um, just a remark about Egypt and Saudi Arabia. Uh, I'm not as sanguine, I guess, as Joseph is in the book about what's been happening in either one of these countries. Uh, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi made a great couple of speeches about three years ago. You saw the interview. So he's definitely talked the talk. Um, uh, has he walked the walk? Well, I haven't been to Egypt a lot lately, but if you talk to Egyptians, uh, a lot of them are kind of pessimistic. You look, for example, at the number of attacks against Coptic Christians. Uh, you look at basically any me metric you want of what's actually going on on the street. Uh, there's no walk being walked. It's just talk. And a lot of Egyptians maybe have earned the right to be a little cynical about this, but one, one told me just last week, so what's really happening in Egypt and to some extent in Saudi Arabia, it's not about what you can do that and what's right to do or what's wrong to do. It's about who can do what's right and what's wrong. I mean, these are very class stratified societies. So if you are <coughs> of high social status and you're protected, basically, you could do whatever the hell you want. Uh, so a lot of these, a lot of these finger pointings are, are pointed to people who really are, have, have low social capital. And, and uh, so it's not exactly an equally applied sort of sort of uh, reform effort. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm told. As I say, I take it, I take it uh, with a grain of salt. I haven't spent much time in Egypt lately. Saudi Arabia, same thing. Um, uh, Mohammed bin Salman, uh, he's very telegenic. He's made a lot of noise. He's thrown his cousins in jail. How long he'll last uh, trying to do what he's, what he's doing after having you know, broken not one but two sort of traditions of consensus in, in, the, Saudi, in the Saudi world remains to be seen. Okay? He's making, he made a lot of enemies already. And he's 30 years old, for God's sake, right? 30? Made a lot of enemies for a kid. All right, so it just seems to me that uh, what's going on, and I read something, um, some, something uh, some Algerian made public a couple of weeks ago. And really what's going on is the directive from Saudi Arabia out to people in, in Algeria that what's going on is an attempt to, to roll back radicalism and change institutions inside the kingdom. But it remains to be seen if the export uh, of Salafism via the madrasas that are funded by Saudi uh, princes and so forth, whether, whether that's part of the deal or not. Uh, it may be sort of like reforming one country, you know, rather than uh, a, a genuine effort to roll back all the, all the damage that, uh, uh, that uh, Saudi Wahhabism has done over the past 25 or 30 years. It remains to be seen. And again, in Saudi Arabia, like in Egypt, uh, it's not just what can or cannot be done or who or who. It's about who can do it. You know, where you are in society that allows you a certain amount of protection uh, against, uh, against edicts from the government and various kinds of... Um, 
I mean, I, I will agree that there's been progress in Saudi Arabia. Lots, lots changed, uh, most of it for the, for the better. But how deep it goes and how sustained it's going to be and what effects it's going to have outside the kingdom, I'm a little more pessimistic, I guess, than, than you seem to be in the book, Joseph. So I'll stop there. Joseph, did you have a response to anything that Adam or Ambassador Fernandez had to say? Um, well, I think that, uh, first of all, Ambassador Fernandez um, is making the point uh, and actually acting on it that um, American broadcasting in Arabic needs to keep up with a very fluid competitive landscape. Uh, the premise that surrogate journalism on its own um, uh, will satisfy and maintain an audience is unfounded in an environment of hundreds of satellite channels uh, and many authoritative uh, outlets of sur surrogate journalism that have been at it for decades. Uh, and I really like what I'm seeing on the uh, opinion pages of uh, Zawiya Okhra. Uh, and I'm excited about some of those writers starting their own shows. Um, I take the point that <laughs> There he is. I take the point that um, that patriarch, or I should say that tribal and clan affiliations are important. Um, and yes, um, I do not get into the minutia of those issues. Um, I would note, however, that um, you, we are seeing a trend, which I tried to describe, uh, in several Gulf states where an effort is being made to supersede the patriarchal uh, sort of extra systemic legal mechanisms. In other words, the orf, the tribal law, which is something that um, has been a very powerful factor, and something that in, until in, you know, recent memory, uh, people in the UAE would go to, not go to the legal system, but to, a, um, to an elder uh, cleric uh, to arbitrate disputes. Uh, and so it is important to note that in addition to the impositions of ideas about Islamic law, there is also uh, a kind of a tribal canon uh, that one finds in Gulf states in particular, uh, in Jordan and elsewhere. Um, in the UAE, there is a new project, uh, which I had an opportunity to examine a little bit, uh, called the Bureau of the Culture of Lawfulness. I know that sounds a little strange, uh, but it is something that is dedicated to asserting legal authority over the, over the culture. In other words, uh, resting um, uh, legal arbitration from tribes and clans, in addition to beginning to uh, introduce the concept of the rule of law the rule of one legal system that supersedes all others. Um, there are indications that it's been somewhat effective. Part of it is about teaching police to uh, embrace the rule of law, uh, a big part of what they're doing, in fact. Um, but it is certainly something that I think is to be commended and, and watched very carefully. You can look at it and look at many other efforts to promote the rule of law in Arab countries and assess that what they're really promoting is rule by law. That is, they don't counsel that the population owns the legal system and is free to amend the laws. But the ruler commits to ruling by law rather than by fiat. And that, in many um, Arab environments, is, is significant progress. Um, so I guess I, those are two very quick and initial responses to, uh, to the both. Thank you. Thank you. Um, since we're running short on time, I did want to open it up to Q&A with all of you. This gentleman here in the third row, there's a microphone. And when it comes around, if you could introduce yourself and uh, keep your questions short. Uh, My name is Hani Ukele. I got two quick questions, one for Joseph and one for Ambassador. Um, for Joseph, um, with the presence of channels like the YouTube channels uh, and the huge appetite for them in um, the Arab world, how does that um, 
effect, I guess, broadcast um, when it comes to credibility and, and, and trustworthiness. And the second question for the ambassador is, um, with the changes happening in ABN and Al Hurra, um, how are you mitigating the already existing sentiment of, you know, um, they're trying to westernize or change our culture or that American message being pushed or forced down our throats? Um, how are you, how are you um, addressing that uh, to be able to actually gain more audiences, I guess, or trust within that region? Thank you. Um, with respect to YouTube, and for that matter, uh, I'll just add social media for purposes of this discussion. Uh, these new media uh, platforms, um, after euphoria over their use as a tool of mobilization, mobilization around a negative, <coughs> down a regime, have settled uh, to a significant degree down to something more familiar here in the US which is that they serve uh, to intensify the relationship between a celebrity who is on traditional media and his audience or her audience. Um, so that is a lot of what you find uh, in the Twitter sphere uh, and in YouTube uh, is actually a kind of an extension of traditional media. Uh, that said, the likes of the Bashir show, the comedy show from Iraq that opened this presentation, uh, started out on YouTube. Uh, Khambala, a very popular Saudi uh, series of skits, started out on YouTube. Uh, it's more popular than a lot of uh, conventional television shows. Mm. Yes. Indeed, um, many voices that have achieved popularity on YouTube, um, independent of any traditional media, um, they do it to skirt uh, information control. So for example, there's someone named Yusuf Hussein, uh, a, an Egyptian comedian, probably based in Qatar, although that's ex uh, obscured, um, who has uh, got his own daily show. Uh, the Joe Show, that's spoofing uh, Sisi and the Egyptian establishment. And he's enormously popular uh, in Egypt, and he's using YouTube to access uh, the interior. I just want to add, though, about you. Uh, I know some people who are now uh, just now launching a Persian language broadcast, targeting, of course, the Iranian interior. It's wide open territory in the sense that um, there's a lot less of it, and much of what isn't controlled by the government is kind of sleepy uh, opposition uh, broadcast that's very frontal and a lot of exhortation. But they cannot uh, hire stringers in Iran without um, they're getting arrested as soon as they're caught. And so they are relying on YouTube. They're relying on citizen journalism footage from inside Iran that is uh, being posted spontaneously in order to, um, um, to populate uh, their programming. When, after Sisi's, after the, uh, I should say, the ouster of Mohammed Morsi at the hands of the Egyptian military, with popular support, to be sure, uh, Al Jazeera, Mubashir Masr, was evicted from the country. They too turned to YouTube because they set up shop again in Qatar. Uh, and it was basically talking heads arguing about footage that they had gained uh, from YouTube. So there is an ecosystem, there is a continuum of crossover. Um, uh, and certainly it opens up many new possibilities. Uh, but I find that we should be under no illusions uh, about uh, you know, the importance of conventional media uh, and the need to find ways um, to positively impact the content of the largest broadcasts in the region. 
Uh, well, on, on your question, look, everyone knows that uh, Al Hurran MBN is the American funded uh, network. I, I think what you have to do is you have to, you have to mix it up. When we embrace, for example, as we have under my tenure, uh, voices of historic figures, say, for example, someone like uh, Mohammed Barghout, who I knew, uh, or Mahmoud Mohammed Taha. Neither of those guys, Mohammed Barghout was not very pro American. Uh, you know, uh, Taha was not a creation of the Americans. His idea of Islam and liberal Islam was completely autochthonous. So, so we're not, you know, we're not pushing, you know, be like Thomas Jefferson. We're saying, hey, look at this really interesting guy that came from the region, was a son of the region, and had these very interesting things to say. That's number one. Number two, the other, the other way you answer the American question is you have to be multifaceted in what you're presenting about the United States. I mean, I'll give you an example of something which I did, which some people thought I was crazy. Maybe you'll think that I was crazy. Is I commissioned uh, something that I care about. I commissioned a documentary that I'll, I wanted Al Hora to do on the opioid crisis in the United States. And it was an hour long or 45 minute long documentary we had in, uh, in November. It got a lot of attention. A lot of people who wrote in said like, why are you showing this ugly thing about America? This is actually makes you look in a bad light. This is an own goal. You're like, that. but you know what? I did it for one, for two reasons. One is to kind of show the multiplicity of what is America as many things. But number two is this month, well, actually next month, February, we have the second part of that series, which is an hour-long doc documentary about drug abuse in the Arab world and about addiction in the Arab world. And we have, we have stories and images and pictures of some very ugly stuff happening in Morocco and in Egypt and in Palestine and other places about drug abuse, which you sometimes see in the Arab media, but often you don't see in the Arab media. So those are some strategies you would use. Sir, in the second row here. I am Mark Kimmett. Uh, I've spent a lot of time on Arab media. I, the fundamental premise of your liberalism is that is allowed by the country. Most of these countries are authoritarian. And as we've seen over the past two weeks, ever since Turkey went into Syria, PRT as a station has just completely gone from being liberal media to essentially support for the Turkish operation, which means there's not a lot of voice for dissent. I agree with your comment, Alberto, about the ant, but the ants can be stepped on very quickly, particularly by authoritarian regimes. So how much of your basic premise um, is challenged by the authoritarian nature of the countries and whether they will continue to permit this liberalism on their channels? The, um, in Saudi Arabia, when uh, the, the term liberal is uh, targeted, uh, for denigration, and in fact, liberalism was once pr was pronounced a terrorist uh, 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 ideology, uh, together with that of the Muslim Brotherhood in 2014. Uh, liberals have renamed themselves at times in order to avoid having to engage that, uh, that debate. But uh, Saudi liberals tend to divide themselves into two types of liberals. Uh, political liberals who are pressing for political rights, and social liberals who are the ones one sees on Saudi television, uh, who believe in a generational bargain with Arab autocrats to limit their uh, efforts <coughs> to values promotion uh, and forswear uh, aggressive demands for political participation. Um, their gamble is that um, the ruler will put up with them, provided they uh, tow the line on foreign affairs and uh, a, a range of domestic issues. Um, so I'm, rather than judge uh, the, the trade-offs myself, I'll say that um, it is the considered view of quite a few seasoned liberals uh, in uh, Saudi Arabia and elsewhere in the region, who, many of whom themselves were dissidents in the past, 
uh, that this generational bargain uh, is worthwhile. If there is a basis for optimism, it might be uh, a look at Morocco. Uh, there, were, there were many uh, dissidents uh, of the left who, at a certain point, were invited to uh, join the government or join the establishment as public voices, granted all kinds of latitude. Uh, and we have seen uh, the ways in which um, they built on the space that they were granted. They played a role in equity and reconciliation, uh, which was a very important part of the post-1999 reforms in Morocco. Uh, and so there are also precedents uh, for this um, generational bargain. Okay, just one point on what you said, uh, General Kimmett. Uh, it, it, it's actually interesting you mentioned TRT. One thing, I made an editorial decision when the stuff in Afrin started that we were going to give full coverage of voices from Afrin, something which you don't find in most of the pan-Arab stations, certainly not Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera is completely in the pocket of Turkey when it comes to that operation. So we have actually... we. we No, no. What I mean is, yeah, talking heads talking to each other, but presenting the people from the ground speaking on the ground and stuff like that. Yeah, well, but you're not speaking in Arabic to Arab audiences. Anyway, the point I'm making is the, a, a sympathetic view from the ground of Afrin or of kind of Kurdish aspirations. Those come and go in the pan-Arab media. Sometimes they are, sometimes they aren't. But when the Afrin happened, you saw actually a kind of, you know, there, there are those who are pro-Turkish and those who are anti-Turkish. And we saw an opportunity of kind of presenting a full picture of it. And we've seen our numbers in certain places skyrocket as a result of that, because we were putting out material that uh, Arab audiences that were looking for that information couldn't find elsewhere. We actually saw that statistically in kind of retweets and copies and, and likes and numbers of that of material we're putting out on a free which they couldn't find elsewhere. So, Thank you. I, this gentleman here in the second row. Thank you. My name is Miguel. Um, picking up on Adam's observation of the importance of matching attitudes and institutions, to me, two major determinants of attitude are, one, the overwhelming influence of one religion in shaping public messages and attitudes. Um, and I draw a parallel to how much courage did it take Martin Luther to stand up to the Holy Roman Church before he gathered others around. The other, the other determinant, I think, is a, a lack of education that leads poorer populations, when given the chance to vote, to adopt a religious-based message leading to outcomes like the victories of Hamas and, and the Muslim Brotherhood. So in terms of shaping those attitudes, addressing those two determinants, what would your thoughts be? Well, you're perfectly right about the education piece. That's, I think that's really critical. And uh, I think it's fairly widely known that styles of education differ from culture to culture, and that the emphasis that Joseph puts on the capacity for critical thinking and for um, thinking as an individual rather than as part of, part of a, a group or a clique, something that comes almost second nature to people in the West, but not necessarily second nature in many other societies. Those things are absolutely critical. So how do you nurture uh, a new, new forms, new styles of education um, in these countries? Well, it's not easy. If I knew, I'd, I'd probably be famous or I'd something, but it's not easy to do. I mean, uh, these, are, these are very old, um, uh, very ingrained traditions, and they're related to um, webs of other social values that are sometimes connected to religion, but not necessarily. So they're, they're deeply anchored. And to change them is, is really difficult. One thing that I, I've suggested uh, to anybody who'd listen, which is, I don't think, very many people, uh, every, Arab, uh, every, every junior high school, high school, whatever, uh, in the Arab world ought to have a, 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 an earth science lab and ought to have an earth science lab, and ought to have a teacher who knows how to use the lab. Why do I say that? Because uh, science is not a mass of facts. Science is a process. It's a human process. It teaches you how to observe. It teaches you how to trust your own senses, but also test 
your own perceptions, right? It's also a social activity because in science, one builds together with others and one advances, one advances knowledge little by little, piece by piece, on the shoulders of, of titans, Robert Merton said. Um, the Arab world used to be a beacon of science back in the day. Not so much lately, all right? Uh, I, think it would, I think just teaching kids, you know, systematically how to observe, um, how to analyze facts that are separate from how anybody feels about them, all right? That in the long run, that kind of payoff, you're going to get a payoff from, from education like that uh, more than you will from a lot of other sort of, you know, uh, one-off, hit-and-miss kinds of, kinds of efforts. Now, people say, well, um, the Arabs have tried that, and the engineers, the ones who, you know, t do the math, and the, they turn out to be the most radical. Well, that doesn't have to be. I I'm talking about a, uh, an effort to, to invest in, in human capital and, and orthogonally to invest in social trust through investing in human capital as a long-range long project. Uh, I think you've got to do that. I don't think anything else works in terms of um, correspondence between the effort to create li you know, more liberal institutions on the one hand and attitudes on the other. And again, I think, I think social structure matters. I think in some countries the prevalence of parallel or cross-cousin marriage and all of these very old, I think all of this stuff matters. And how you change this, how you move this, well, boy, I mean, there are plenty of debates and there, there are plenty of ideas and, and nobody knows. But I, I think you're absolutely right. Start with education. Thank you. We want to be respectful of everybody's time, and we're formally out of it for this panel. So if all of us could thank our panelists for all of their really fascinating presentations. Uh, and thank you all for coming. There are books for sale outside, so we hope that you'll leave with one. And uh, thank you again. <clears throat>